incredible time tonight. Uh, God showed me some things in the spirit that He's going to do, and so that, is, that brings great excitement to me. Sometimes I go to a meeting without a word, and I just re- wait for the Holy Spirit to show up, but tonight He already showed me that w- what He's about to do, and so that's a great encouragement to me, and so I'm just going to set you up to allow the Holy Spirit to come and do what only He can do. You know, uh, when He touches you, He can come and bring a alignment in your life in a minute that a person cannot bring in a lifetime. He has the power to do that. And I really sense that there's going to be things that's going to be birthed uh, tonight in the Spirit that is going to be very powerful in your life right now. Amen. Amen. We're going to have to cover a lot of ground. I do um, this type of meeting that I'm going to do tonight with you. I do it over 10 sessions. And I'm going to do it now in like 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And so we're going to cover a lot of ground. And it's a, there's a reason why we're doing it and setting you up. And so I want to encourage you to just listen to the recording again when you can. If you're taking notes, take notes. Um, but at some stage, you won't be able to keep up. So um, we're going to just bring a lot of adjustment in your life and set you up for what God wants to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we are men gathered here tonight, the locker room, that you have brought us to this place, a meeting place. And Father, I declare that we will not leave the same that we came. We'll leave here with fresh vision, purpose. Father, with blueprints from heaven that's being poured out to us, revealing to us our future and our destiny and also the callings that is upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm trusting God tonight for blueprints. Blueprints can be downloaded to you within minutes, where heaven just connects with you and a blueprint comes upon your life. I'm going to minister to you prophetically tonight, but that's not my aim and what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to connect you with heaven tonight and let the Holy Spirit come and give you a plan, a business plan, a blueprint, a vivid image of your future and where you are going. Imagine being born and receiving a vivid picture of your future and being able to go throughout your life with that picture and every now and again going back to that picture to make sure that you are aligned with God's purpose and plans. And that is what I'm trusting for tonight. This has got nothing to do with age. No matter how young you are here tonight, you can receive those blueprints no matter how old you are. You know, in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as age. God doesn't see any limitation. When he looks at us, he doesn't see sickness or disease or, or any form of disability or limitation. We see limitations in people, but God does not see that. And so we trust in God for blueprints, that he would come and just drop it within your spirit. It is definitely happening, happening tonight. Maybe it might hit you a couple of days from now, but God's going to birth something inside you, and I'm going to prepare you for that to continue. Now, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 talks about... Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Now most people sleep in church when we read that scripture, seek the kingdom of God, and then we, when they hear all these things, they wake up. And then people say, well, what, what, what do I have to do to get all these things? Uh, seek the kingdom. Oh, Okay. And then they start to seek the kingdom of God with the wrong motive and the wrong intention. Their heart is never to build the kingdom of God. They just want all these things. And so now they come to church or they do everything religious that they think they need to do just to get all these things. Their heart has never been the kingdom. It's always been all these things, stuff, things being added on. Now to just deal with any form of religion right now, all these things means all these things. Okay. So there's nothing excluded. There's, there's nothing that's limited from all these things. And so when God says all these things shall be added, nothing is excluded. There's no limit to those things. But the focus is the kingdom of God and building the kingdom of God. Let me explain it to you. If we give a million dollars to every person in this room tonight, the majority of people only have their own kingdom in mind. What it means is the vision 
for that million dollars is not the kingdom of God. It is paying off your debt, taking care of your family, going on vacation. That's the purpose of that. So most people don't have a vision for kingdom finances or kingdom resources. They just have a heart to build their own kingdom. They immediately think, well, I'm going to do this and this and this, and God is not in that. I'm not here tonight to say to you that God does not want to take care of that, but I'm trusting God to give you a bigger blueprint. Instead of just trusting God for your own family, getting debt-free, to have a kingdom assignment that's bigger than yourself. Instead of just praying and trusting God for your family to start to trust Him and to do business and to do ministry and to function in the role where you are, not just for you, but another hundred families. Now it becomes kingdom. Now it's something different. We put a delay upon our own lives because most people just want to cash out. What does it mean? It means if I can just get that deal, I'm done. I'm working for that number, for that place, for that position, and once I've achieved it, I'm out. The true power of purpose is that if you would receive a million dollars today and you would get up tomorrow morning and do the very same thing that you did yesterday, then you are truly busy building the kingdom. So most people just want out. And so it brings a delay upon their lives because God needs them where they are for his kingdom and so he can't bless them because they would just leave. And so God has put them in a business or in a certain capacity and he's using them there to build his kingdom and they are bringing a delay upon their lives because they have a, their focus is, well, if I can just get to that place, I'm out. I'm moving to Florida and I'm going to sit at the beach and do nothing for the rest of my life. So there's no kingdom purpose in their lives. Tonight I'm not saying I want to take from you, I want to add to your life. I want to say, God, here is my business plan, here's my blueprint, but add to it. Give me a kingdom vision that when you bless me on a level that's beyond what I can a handle in my life that I would know that there's a purpose to that resource. We, we talk about something and it's already started to happen. It's called kingdom financiers or the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Right now, the problem in the kingdom of God is not money, but stewardship. God has no limit in what he can do. But, he, but there's no stewardship. There's no people that are truly stewards. Their own Vision and purpose is just for themselves. How can God bless a business for heaven's sake that was born in hell? If the initiation of that business or plan was never to build the kingdom of God, but just to, prof, just, just to prof, prosper your own needs and desires, how can God bless that? I'm encouraging you tonight just to ex enlarge your vision. And say, God, I'm trusting for my family and I'm trusting for all of, these, all of these things. But above and beyond that, I want a kingdom assignment. Add to my vision. What do I need to do? Do I need to build churches, schools, support families, settle people's debt? What, what do you need above that? Establish your kingdom on earth in different places and nations. Above my desires, what do you need from me? Now suddenly you are connecting yourself to heaven's resources. And God says, here is a place, a family, a person that I can bless and I can steer resources in that direction because they have purpose. More than just building their own kingdom and their own life. Amen? So we're going to address two things tonight. We're going to address the spirit of poverty tonight. And that is what God is going to set you free from tonight. And then we are also going to address debt. Debt. Now, when we talk about debt, it has different meanings in different places. When I talk about debt, I do business conferences in South Africa. When I talk about debt in South Africa, it's different from America. 
And the reason is that our interest rate is very high in South Africa. Our interest rate, I've got properties and, and the properties that I have in South Africa, the interest rate in those properties range from the lowest is 9.8% is and the highest is 14%. So that is our interest rate where we are when it comes to property. Vehicles is the same. Vehicles are, again, I mean, if you really a good client, you can get 10%, but most young people start off with 16% when they buy a vehicle. So when I talk about debt, it has a different meaning. Europe's debt ratio is different, America is different, and South Africa is different. And so it's different when we talk about how we handle that. But no matter what the interest rate is, God has called you to live a debt-free life. He has called you to be a debt-free life. There is nothing holy about debt. And I'm going to deal with that tonight, and we're going to go through a couple of practical things, and I believe that God can set you free. No matter where you are and what you're facing, God can remove that form of bondage in your life. Now, we don't, a lot of people don't have money problems, they have wisdom problems. And so you can give them any amount, it's not going to change anything. Because money won't fix their problems. They need wisdom. And so there's a couple of places where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from reading Proverbs. I want to encourage every man in this room right now to read the book of Proverbs once a year. Once a year to read the book of Proverbs. So wisdom comes from reading Proverbs. Wisdom comes from the books that you read. And so not just the Bible, but the books that you read. Wisdom comes from people you associate with, you surround yourself with. Wisdom comes from the mistakes that you've made in life. And so this is where we gain wisdom from, from these places. And so we need wisdom. The challenge about wisdom is that by the time you pray for it, it's too late. Amen. <laughs> and so, so start to pray for wisdom now. God, give me wisdom. That when the time comes, that I'll be ready to know what decisions I have to make. When you're in that storm and suddenly you're shouting and saying, Lord, give me wisdom, it's already too late. You're in a battle already. And so you are caught in that place because you have a wisdom problem. We have something in South Africa that has started the last couple of years. It's a school that we opened for young people from the age of 18 to 21. And it's, cool. it's called Billionaires in Training. We take young people and we teach them how to buy their first house and their first car. And that's it. You know, I did not have that. I made so many mistakes buying property and also buying cars that I, I didn't have someone that mentored me and taught me how to do it. And so it is important because what you think you know, you think everyone knows that. And they don't. There's a generation, kingdom generation, that's arising now, and it's our responsibility to train them, to teach them, to equip them, to help them through the first couple of steps. Imagine someone was there when you made those decisions to, to navigate you and to guide you and say to you, well, this, because most people are so indebted in their lives in the first steps that they take, it takes an entire lifetime to get out of that mortgage or out of that debt that they never live a life of victory. Amen? Very quiet tonight. <laughs> Amen. There's no woman here. Don't worry. <clears throat> no one knows. Okay. So when you talk about poverty, poverty has got nothing to do with money because you can be a billionaire and still have a poverty mindset. I've met many people today that have become very wealthy, but they still have a poverty mindset. The way they do things, they still carry a spirit of poverty on them. Now, I saw physically the spirit of poverty in Namibia a couple of years ago. It is the most filthy demon that there is. It's a spirit that brings an entire family and and generation into poverty. It steals and strips you from everything. The purpose of that is to destroy everything that you touch. It's a spirit that can be passed on from generation to generation 
And tonight, God is releasing you from any form of poverty. He's setting you free. Now, there's also something called a poverty mindset. So the purpose of, of a poverty mindset is to lead you into debt. Once the poverty mindset has led you into debt, then you become a slave. And you cannot serve two masters. Suddenly, the one has complete control out of, over your life, and I'm going to share the impact of that tonight, what it does. And so, number one, a poverty mindset is a mindset that people develop over time based on a strong belief that they will never have enough. Over time, it develops, and that's why I said you can be a billionaire, but still have a spirit of poverty that feels you need to continue to accumulate more. Need never enough, need more, need more, need more. So there's no kingdom assignment. It is just, I have to gain more. I was poor, I didn't have, and so I need to gain, gain. And no matter how much you gain, you're still empty. And so that is a poverty mindset. A poverty mindset uh, is, having a poverty mindset means accepting and believing that nothing will ever change for you. And therefore, you should make peace with your current situation and stop to invest in growth. So what a poverty mindset does, it says, well, accept where you are. Because you will never change and nothing will ever change for you. You're going to be here for the rest of your life. That is the purpose of a poverty mindset. And so I want to read you this quote. In fact, when I read it, um, it is a guy called Alan Greenspan. He was the former chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve. And he says, I have found no greater satisfaction than achieving success through honest dealings and strict adherence to the view that for you to gain, those you deal with should gain as well. Poverty mindset is, it's all about me. And so my business grows, my life grows, my ministry grows at the cost of everyone else. And so it's just about me. It's not growing any, anything else. That is a poverty mindset. And so as kingdom citizens, we have to understand that as we grow, the people that are with us should continue to grow as well. Amen. Because it's a partnership. What does it help if one business continues to grow, but yet the people that have partnered with that business, with that ministry, remains where they are? In ministry, it's important for me that the people that are with me, even though I grow, that they grow with me. I'm not going to leave them where they are. They need to grow. They need to move on with me on the same level because I have a kingdom assignment that God has given me. And so Luke chapter 19 verse 13, he says, so he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. He says, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Put this money to work until I come back. And this is a parable which he is explaining to them that the master has entrusted us with certain giftings and then the master will come back and he wants to see what did we do, stewardship, with what we received. And so the command was never to work for money, but to create an environment where money can work for you. That was the mandate. Not just for, for business people, for all of us. Not just for everyone. God has entrusted us with giftings, and he says, Put it to work till I return. And so when Jesus comes back, he wants to receive an account of what you have done with what he's entrusted you with. So I've personally chosen property in my life because it was something that uh, could not hinder or limit my focus from ministry. And so it made it easier for us to invest in property and have rental property because it was easier to manage. And also, we had a management company that could take care of those properties, so I didn't have to be there on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with that. Um, someone took care of it. And so I have a responsibility to take what I have. Now, no one told me. I didn't have someone that taught me. So I made a lot of mistakes in, in property. I signed many deals that God did not sign. 
want you to know tonight that when you put your signature on something, you have to have the peace upon your heart that God can put His signature next to yours. If you don't have the peace that God would sign it, you don't sign it. That is what kingdom finance is about. It means that I truly have the peace in my heart that God would sign this contract with me. If you don't believe or you hesitate that God would even put his signature on that, you don't sign. Because you might sign, we men here tonight, you might sign a contract with a demon, with something that opposes the kingdom of God, and that would be your downfall. And so it's important. So just a piece, it's simple. I have a man, I've got a friend of mine, and so I said to him, well, we need to, at seems we need to go to Europe and uh, we have to go on a specific trip to minister. And so I said to him, well, we need to go and, and uh, uh, do you want to come with me on this trip? He said, I'm not sure. Um, just give me a week to pray about it. And I said to him, no, no, no. We have the spirit of God and we have the mind of Christ. And so what is God saying to you now? You don't have to pray about it. What's the leading of the Holy Spirit in your spirit now? And as men, we have to learn to trust the Spirit. If the Spirit says no, if you have to go pray about it, it's been a no in any way. And so just say no. You don't have to wait a week. Just what, what's in your spirit? What does your spirit say? If I say it to you, if that contract comes in front of your eyes, what happens in your spirit? Is it a yes or no? If it's a no or you're unsure, walk away. Just learn to trust the unction of, of the Spirit in that voice inside you that says, no, just walk away. Don't try to make it a right because what happens is we hear no, but we pray it into a yes. And that's an Abraham Ishmael situation. And then we try to find someone that would come into agreement with what we want to do. God says no, but then you go. Right, you're looking for a pastor, looking for a prophet, you, try, you hear, no, no, oh, you're going to find someone that will agree to what you want to do. And what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for something that's going to bring great harm in the future. As so we have to learn to listen to the Spirit. Listen, God is for you, not against you. God's not trying to keep anything from you, so He wants to build you, establish you, but He wants us to live a life of obedience. And so there's a responsibility on everyone that when the master comes back, that we have reproduced what he has given us. That not what you're going to get, what he's given you already. The giftings, the talents, the abilities that you already carry, that you are, are multiplying that. We're not praying and saying, God, give me. He's already given you something. And so we have to use that and work with that which is given to us. And so I'm going to share this with you. Poverty is a sign of a curse. When you see poverty, it's a sign of a curse. Now, debt is a sign of slavery. When someone is in debt, they are enslaved. And so I want to say to you tonight, choose your master carefully. Debt is slavery. And then thirdly, Lack is a sign of bad stewardship. Number one, I'm going to say it again, poverty is a sign of a curse, and we can break that. Number two, debt is a sign of slavery. Again, you have to have wisdom tonight. There's different, different levels of people here. There's people here that, <laughs> that's been using and abusing the banks to do a lot, so we're in different levels. You have to have wisdom tonight, different capacity of businesses and people. And so don't just take what I say, have wisdom even in the words, so how it applies to your situation. We're in different environments. And so debt is a sign of slavery. And lack is a sign of bad stewardship. If a person has lack in their lives, Giving them more is not going to fix the problem. And we are quick to sow into lack. And we have to understand that you're, not, you're making it worse. It doesn't help that. They need stewardship. And it's your responsibility 
to teach them to be stewards. I have a church in South Africa that phoned me just before I came here. They phoned me, a very large church, and they said, listen, we need you to really come and see us. So they flown me there, we had a secret meeting, and they say to me, we have a huge problem in our church. The pastor says to me, listen, he says, we have trained our people to sow into lack. And so now, our buildings are paid off, we have no debt, and people are not giving anymore. Because we taught them for 30 years only to sow where there's a need. God is taking the church in this, in this year to a place where we will not just sow into lack, but into overflow. You cannot just be drawn to lack. They will always, the poor will always be among us. But we, even in our sowing, we have to be led by the Spirit. And so we have been taught that where there's a lack, we have, to need to, we have to help. But then we look at a person and he dresses well and we think, well, I'm not going to sow because there's no lack. God wants to teach us to sow and to overflow. No matter the situation, because we don't know what is behind it or what is happening, we have to be prompted in our giving by the Holy Spirit. I want to make a statement tonight and say to you, I just spoke at the government class, uh, I want to say to you, this is something you have to realize tonight. Make peace with us tonight. You don't own anything. The money that's in your bank account, it's not yours. In the business, it's not yours. Ministry, it's not yours. We don't own anything but we are stewards of everything. And so we have to learn, yes, there's my need and my desire and my bills that I have to pay. And somehow we think that if we tithe, that it's a bribe to bless the remaining 90%. But we have to understand that the 90% is just as much God's as is the 10%. And so if you're here tonight and you have a problem in giving 10%, just give 14%. It's a simple principle to teach us to become generous. And so if giving a tithe is still a problem, you have to get over that. It's a principle of giving. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning we push ourselves as a family. It's got nothing to do with the church, and nothing to do because someone pressured me. But as a family, I push myself to at least give 30% of my income. Not because I'm demanded to do it, but because I'm a giver. 10% is only for beginners. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. I want to see the kingdom of God move on. I don't want to be the person that when God needed to do something, I was stingy and I delayed the kingdom of God because of my plans and ideas. We can no longer delay what God wants to do because of finances. God needs someone that he can bless and that can be a channel to build his kingdom. I pray tonight for an urgency that would come upon your life that, would you, that you would realize how important the kingdom of God is. We cannot put a value on it. It has to be established. And I want to teach you a principle tonight that when there's a moment of giving into the kingdom of God and you miss it, you are sowing famine into your future. That famine might not even reach you in your generation, but it will, it will, be, it will come upon your children's children. As so we have to learn the kingdom has to advance. I don't get up every morning and go to work and do all of that because my idea is a vacation home, a caravan or this or that. I get up every morning because I want to see the kingdom advance. The kingdom has to move on. And that must be your drive, that Lord, use me as a vessel. Bless my house so that I can be a blessing to your house. 
use me strategically so that the kingdom can be established in all the earth. What does it mean? Why do we need buildings? Because when we have buildings, we are occupying the land. You cannot be a farmer and not own soil. If you say you're a farmer and you don't have soil, you're not a farmer. Because what makes you a farmer is the fact that you have a title deed to soil. And so having property, listen, having property is part of the plan of God. The property should be yours. Now spiritually, something happens in a spiritual realm when you own property. When you lease and rent, you don't have authority. Spiritually, you can't command anything. Only the master of that property has authority in that region. That's why the wicked occupy spaces all over because those spaces give them authority. God wants to put business and churches in the public eye. The best properties right in the main where people in the public eye. He wants to put your business not in the shadow somewhere where no one can find it. He wants to put it in the best place. And we're going to deal with that tonight as we, as we continue. Amen? You're still okay? Okay, a lot of you are frowning and looking down and up and that. I'm not after anything tonight. I'm not after money. I'm after your heart tonight. Looking for your heart. Where is your heart? That's what we're after tonight. Because for God to come and give you a blueprint that would, that would shake this nation, your heart has to come into alignment with His will. There's blueprints from heaven that He wants to release. But your, your heart must be His. God has to know that He has your heart. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Listen, there's people that's going to, from this meeting on, there's people that are going to rise up and step into their callings, into the places where they're going to start to occupy. Young people that's in this room, they're going to step into what God has called them. God's going to enlarge your vision and your territory tonight. Amen? And so, what is a poverty mentality? I'm going to read a couple of things to you, about 20 things. If you have one of these 20 things, you have a poverty mentality. And we're going to pray with you tonight that God would break a poverty mentality over your life. So 20, 20 things that, he, that is signs of a poverty mentality. You don't have to have all 20. Just one of them is a poverty mentality. Number one, a poverty mentality is a bargain mentality. A bargain mentality. And so if it says bargain, then I buy it. That's a poverty mentality. It has to be a bargain. If it's not a bargain, then I'm not buying it. If that shirt, it starts small. If that shirt is on sale, I'll buy it. If it's not on sale, I won't buy it. Poverty mentality. Let me tell you the truth. Cities are not built on bargains. The wicked come in and they pay a fair price and they occupy the land. Why do Christians have to wait for bargains so that they can occupy? Businesses are not established on bargains. And so a bargain mentality is a poverty mentality. God had to break that thing over my life. I used to have a, I'm a car person. I love cars, fast cars. I had cars. I'm a car person. Anyway, I don't have to explain anything. If you're a car person, you'll understand. But I had a poverty mindset. I would search for the best deal that I could find. And then I want to try to get more off of that deal. And by the end, when I walk out of that company or that dealership, you know, I will, I will feel that I won. I've got a good deal. And then when I leave there, the salesperson will never call me again. Because I've done so much harm to that company that to get my bargain that they would never deal with me again in the future. And I would drive that car for three to six months and change it, change it, keep on changing it, keep on going, keep on going. And then one night I went to bed and I couldn't breathe. I didn't know what was happening to me. I phoned a friend of mine at midnight. I went to the living room, sat in the living room. I don't know what's happening. I can't breathe. I'm anxious. I don't know what's happening with me. I phoned a friend of mine. I said, listen, minister, a pastor, I said, what, I don't know what's happening. He said, listen, okay, just get a cup of hot tea or 
hot chocolate or something, and then phoned me back. I got a cup of hot tea, sat down, phoned him. He said, what's happening? I said, I don't, I don't know. I can't breathe. I've, I'm anxious. I've, I can't. He said, well, did you make any drastic decisions lately? Oh, yes, I bought a car yesterday. And he said, debt. Debt is busy destroying you. And suddenly I made the numbers and I realized that I'm so deep, deep in debt. I'm not going to get out of this. And I made a quality decision that day that I will never again make debt in my life. I said, God, I'm going to trust you to get me out of this. And you have to teach me to get debt free. And I'm talking about bad debt, like a very bad debt. And the Lord, it was a journey. I drove a vehicle at that time. Uh, um, I mean, just uh, one of the most expensive vehicles that you can think of. I drove it. But it, I wasn't the one that was driving, it was driving me. I didn't own it, it owned me. And it was incredible driving it because, I mean, wherever I would pull up, I would get a parking at any place right in front of the door. It made me feel great, that vehicle. And then God said, well, this is something we have to deal with right now. And I said, okay, Lord, help me. God said to me, sell that vehicle. I sold it at a loss. And God said to me, okay, now I'm going to teach you. I want you to go into a dealership and buy a vehicle cash that you have the money for in the bank right now. I didn't have a lot of money at that moment. So I couldn't look at the vehicles that I was driving. I had to go way down. Now at that moment, Prophet Ed, I was driving him around and he would tell you the testimony. When I came to pick him up with a, you know, with a First car, he was really happy, but when I came to pick him at the airport up with my little um, dinky toy, he, was, uh, he didn't understand, <laughs> understand that at all. <laughs> but God said to me, take the money that you have, go into a dealership and buy a vehicle cash. I realized, well, I went to the first, I realized, well, I can't drive this make, not this make, not with this type of money. And so I had to go to a really, really, I mean, very low. It's a four-seater, but one, one person can fit into it, really small. And so God said to me, okay, and I'm going to teach you how to buy it now. You go into that dealership and you ask the salesman for the price of that vehicle and you pay the price. Now I'm coming out of a bargain mentality. I know how to negotiate. I know how much money is in those cars. I know exactly the figures and I, I'm ready to bargain. And God says, no, go in, ask him the price of that vehicle and pay that price. Pay a fair price. And I walked in, said, what's the price? He said, this is the price. And that's the money that I had in the bank account. And I bought it. The salesman looked me in the eye. You can understand because I'm not negotiating. And he came in a little bit high because he was ready to negotiate. And, and uh, I just bought the, bought the car. And I left. And God broke a bargain mentality over my life. God said to me, you don't have to bargain. You can afford it and you can buy it. That salesman, I bought that vehicle eight years ago. He still phones me on my birthday every year since then. It was such a good deal to him. And I realized walking out there how many families I destroyed because I wanted a bargain. It was a good deal to me, but they could not feed their children because I was looking for a bargain. And I realized to be blessed, those that I deal with has to be blessed as well. And God broke it. It's a bargain mentality. You go to a restaurant only when there's a sale. And my dad is, my dad loves bargains. They eat Mondays at this place because there's a bargain. Tuesday there is fish and chips. Wednesday there, if we invite us to a restaurant, I know there's some form of sale or bargain that night. It's just always a bargain mentality. When my dad orders from a menu in a restaurant, he looks at the price. doesn't matter what the meal is. He looks for the lowest price and that is what he will eat. It's a bargain mentality. My dad's, we were very poor when we grew up, but my parents are not poor anymore. But that mentality is still there. We were very poor. The poor people called us poor. We were really poor. It's a bargain mentality. I need a, I need a good deal. 
You know, it's, uh, I laugh when I look at my parents today when we do things because a lot of that mentality is, is still there. You know, my dad just figured out that because we have children, that he can order from the kid's menu. <laughs> and it's a great deal to him. <laughs> he, he's so excited. He'll leave that restaurant and said, I just got a burger and chips for two ninety nine. <laughs> it's a great deal. He loves it. <laughs> so you're laughing, but there's people in this room that has that mentality. It's a bargain mentality. Why don't we just trust God to pay a fair price? So that's what the wicked are doing. They're not just paying a fair, fair price. They can put their money on the table and they can, they can <laughs> take authority over that situation. Now, let me explain this to you. Money is not evil. <coughs> money has no spirit. It's not, it's not something evil. It's about the hand that touches it. It's what it's used for, what it's applied to. So don't make money your enemy. It doesn't have a spirit. It's a tool that can build or destroy. As so you have to see it as a tool. It's who touches that money, what happens with it. So number one, I can give you a testimony on every one of these. And so just for time's sake, I'm just going to read all 20 and not spend time on anyone. So what is a poverty mentality? Number one, it's a bargain mentality. Number two, I don't value myself or my possession. It's a poverty mentality. When you don't take care of yourself, if you don't see yourself as worthy to buy new clothes or to, or to dress yourself or take care of yourself, I'm not talking about the most expensive stuff, or if you don't take care of your, prop, your property, stewardship, when God gives you, when you have a vehicle, when you have stuff, take care of it. It's a poverty mentality if you don't take care of what you have. Number three, poverty mentality says, I will never be good enough. So many things I can share. Never be good enough. I remember flying, I mean, for many years. I've, I've done, so when I'm in the US uh, in this time, I normally do between 130 and 160 flights in the time while I'm here. It's because there's so many connections the whole time. But for years and years, I only flew economy class because I thought that I would never be good enough. And so one day, I was in South Africa boarding a plane, sitting in the lounge, waiting for the plane to board, and a pastor friend of mine came in there, and we boarded the plane, and he boarded first class, and I boarded economy. And I sat there in economy class, and I complained with God. I said, Lord, I'm a way better preacher than he is. How come? How come he is flying first class and I have to sit here at the back? And then God says, he has the faith for it. And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, Andre, I can see you in first class, but can you see yourself there? And so I had a poverty mentality that could not see myself in that place. It's not about the money. It's about a mentality that says I can never be there. There's places where God sees you tonight. Can you see yourself in that place? Listen, someone is going to enjoy the luxuries of life. If the Christians don't, the sinners will. It's there. There's tools that's there to make our lives easier, to make us more effective. It's available to us. Something has to change. So it says I will never be good enough. Number four, poverty mentality says I will never have enough. It's a fear of losing. And so when something comes in, I have to protect it because I might never get another paycheck. I might never get another contract. And so this is the last one, so I have to protect it. Number five, a poverty mentality justify Lack and make excuses. It justifies why I am where I am. And so it talks bad about other people because it has to justify my situation. A poverty mentality are critical of people who prosper. If they prosper, you always have something to say about them. It's a poverty mentality. A poverty mentality, don't think the children of God should prosper. Number seven. Number eight. 
a poverty mentality is afraid to give under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you that the enemy will never tell you to give. If you're still confused when, you, when you're prompted to give, if it's, if it's the Holy Spirit or the enemy, he'll never tell you to give. The enemy is not in giving. It's, he doesn't want to put... <laughs> anyway, number nine. A poverty mentality, don't believe that God is your source, but rather a person, a boss, parent, or employer. A poverty mentality believes that someone else is your source. You don't believe that God is your source. I want you to understand tonight that God is your source. Whoever your employer is, they are not your source. They are a channel that God's using to bring blessing to your life, but they are not. God is the source. If God can use that source, he can use another source as well. And so he is the source in our lives. Number 10, a poverty mentality is suspicious that those around you may take your money. And so you're always watching to see who is taking my money. Who wants to do me in? I'm, I'm afraid who I deal with. A poverty mentality is when things are handed out for free, you grab as much as possible, even if you don't need things at all. It's a poverty mentality. I have to grab. Look at today when you, when you go into a poverty area and you deliver food, anything. They just grab as much as they can. It's a poverty mentality. Because it's free, I need to take it. Okay? <laughs> anyway. You can say amen or... <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Number 12, poverty mentality cannot imagine tithing or giving. Can't even imagine it. You're looking, poverty mentality as well. Andre, I can't afford it to tithe. It's a poverty mentality. Can't even imagine how, how would I give to someone. It's a poverty mentality. Poverty mentality is when you see someone prosper, your first thought is, they did something immoral or illegal. You drive on the freeway and then this yellow Porsche comes past you. And you think, they must have done something immoral to drive that. It's your first indication. <laughs> it's a poverty mentality. A poverty mentality is when you cannot work for free... You have to be paid for everything you do. It's a poverty mentality. Have to be paid. I can't serve. I can't give for free. A poverty mentality is when you get jealous when people around you prosper. Someone shares their breakthrough with you or in church and, and you get jealous. Why did they get it? It's a poverty mentality. The truth is if God can do it for them, he can do it for you. And so let's rejoice. And God blesses them. Poverty mentality is when you get uh, is is when you think receiving is better than giving. Why do we give? We give so that we can receive, so that we can give more. That's why we give. We don't give just so that we can get a hundredfold return and cash out and say, "Well done, this is a great meeting, and I'm out." No, it's not. God is not a casino. It's not something we put in and we get a return. God is not a casino. A lot of people think they've got this. I was at a conference and, and we were giving at this conference and this person next to me was writing something in a book and I saw all these numbers. And I said to him, what is that? It's a pastor. We were sitting in front of all the pastors. I said, what is, what is that? He said to me, this is what God owes me. Everything I've given Everything I've given to him, every seed, I write every seed down. That's what he owes me. Wow. I didn't know I was supposed to do it. I, I didn't write down the last <laughs> 10 times when I gave. We don't give. God is not a casino. We give because the word tells us to be generous. The word says a generous person will prosper. He that refreshes others will also be refreshed. That's what the word says. Not a casino. Those of you that just joined the church today, God is not a casino. <laughs> if you're here. <laughs> we give because it's blessed to give. It's, let me tell you the truth. It's way more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. To be in a position where you can give, it's way blessed. Rather be in that position. 
than being on the lender position. Amen. Poverty mentality is uh, when you go to bed, worrying about money. Can't sleep. Think about money. Bills that have to be paid. A poverty mentality is when you make excuses why God could not bless you because of your race, color, or background. It's a poverty mentality. And listen, the enemy is, is playing that. He's saying to people, because of your race, God can't bless you. Because of your culture, because of where you came from, same. doesn't matter where they are in the world. The enemy is using it as a tool and saying, oh, well, because you, out of that background, you can never prosper. It's a lie. And then lastly, a poverty mentality is when your boss, family, or parents become your source and not God. Suddenly people don't pray unto God anymore. They pray unto you. They pray unto a person. So they, they, they say, Lord, please work in that person's heart. They don't realize that God is their source. They pray in the name of their boss, in the name of their mother, in the name of their father, because they start to see those person, that person as, as their source. I want to encourage you, if you are a giver, don't let people pray unto you. Even if you're generous, tell them that, that you are only an instrument in the hand of God. You're not their source. It's what God told you to do and what God, and that's it. You're just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Help them. Don't make them, don't connect them with you. Connect them with God. Use your finances, resources to get them to trust God more, not trust you as a person. Amen? Okay. Should we take a five-minute break or should we continue? What do we do? We keep going. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to end and just leave a lot of the stuff out and get to, get to the end. So, like I said, I can do three or four more sessions on this, but we want to deal specifically tonight with a poverty mentality. It's going to set you free and renew your mind that you don't have a bargain mentality, a sale mentality. You can, you're not driven by that. If you need it, buy it. But don't have 10 shirts that are all bargains and you're just wearing two. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm glad the woman is not here tonight. There's going to be some woman <laughs> that's going to have a lot of testimonies. <laughs> okay, so I believe God has called us to live debt-free lives, completely debt-free. Again, you have to have wisdom when it comes to debt. If a bank would give me money at 0% interest rate, I will take it. If I can work with it, I'm, again, I'm not going to apply that money to buy, to, to pay for a vacation. It's, we have to have wisdom and how we deal with that. And so, and again, in South Africa, I mean, the best rate interest rate that we can get when we loan money from the bank the, the, is 10%. That's it. So it, it sounds 10%, but in a mortgage over 20 years, it is triple the amount that you're paying back. So it's, it's yeah, anyway. So you have to have wisdom where you are. Have wisdom where you are and who you move with. Okay, so what does debt do? Debt does... Six things I want to focus on to die tonight. Number one, debt destroys vision. You can't have vision because you have to focus on debt. Debt destroys marriages. It's very difficult for a marriage to function when it's full of debt. It brings unnecessary fights and arguments and things that's not necessary. And so we encourage you. So what does debt do? It destroys marriages. Debt destroys your progress. You can move forward in life because it brings a delay upon your life. Debt destroys your testimony. You can share your testimony because it's not working for you. So it destroys what God wants to do in your life. Debt destroys your joy. It steals your sleep. You can be full of joy. Your wife is wondering why you're so grumpy. It's because debt is destroying your joy. Don't have, don't have a reason to live anymore. And then number six, debt 
destroys your ability to sow. There's times of giving, and then there's times where there's a supernatural harvest. Don't know if any of you have experienced it, but I'm a giver. But then there are these moments, and then God tells me that now there's something different. When I sow now, it'll be a supernatural harvest. There are these moments in my life. The challenge of debt is that when that moment comes of a hundredfold harvest, debt will keep you from giving because you can't afford it. I can't do it. I'm prompted, I want to, but I'm overwhelmed. I've got so much bills that I have to pay. I can't sow a seed. I have to learn. Now, when it comes to being a finance, kingdom financier or a giver, we have to start somewhere. And tonight, I'm not putting any pressure on you, but I want to ignite something within you. A couple of years ago, I was in Dallas in a church, and uh, a man came to me, and he was just crying at the end of the meeting. He came to me. He said, God just spoke to me. He said, God said to me that I should buy you an aircraft. I was so excited. I said, well, let's, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> he said, well, the problem is I've never been as poor as I am right now. He took money out of his pocket and the note was one dollar. He says, I want to start moving in the direction of what God has prompted me. <coughs> Tears in his eyes. He said, will you accept this dollar as a start? Often when God speaks to us, we think, well, we can't do it because we're not there yet. Here's a man that is prompted in what God is speaking to him about. He's not in that capacity yet, but he recognizes what God says. And he says, well, this is what I can do. I mean, not, I'm not in that capacity, but I'm going to start. And so being a kingdom financier has got nothing about giving millions to the kingdom. It's about being obedient to what God tells you to do. I visited him a year ago. God has started to restore his companies. He's not quite there yet, but the restoration has started by sowing one dollar. His business are all, all busy turning around because of that. And that's why we have to respond when God speaks to us with what we have. I remember he was crying, weeping. He said, will you accept this? Will you receive this? Will you receive this? It's all that I have right now. Will you take it? Credible man of faith. It's not about the stuff. It's about his kingdom. It's not about the things. It's about the principle of someone that hears the voice of God and that's obedient to his voice. I want to end tonight, and this is what we're going to pray for as well. Um, I have to leave a lot of stuff out and need to get to where we need to go. I want to end tonight with David. So, <clears throat> David comes to the battlefield. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? What will be done? David walks into the right moment at the right time. All of us know David today because of this story. That's what he's, if I say David, there's immediately a picture that comes up because of one story. Just one moment. One moment. So David comes onto the field, a supernatural moment. God set him up. God prepared him. He walks onto this battlefield and Saul is looking for someone that will fight Goliath. David walks onto the field and he says, what would a man get that does this? And so Saul says, I will make him debt free. I will make him debt free. Now what we don't know today is you study the name Goliath. 
Goliath means the one who entraps, the one enslaves, it means death. So David walks on the field and he says, Saul says, I'll make him dead free. But David has an anointing to negotiate. Let me explain something to you. Those of you that are in business, people will never pay you what you are worth, but they will pay you what you negotiate. And so we're going to pray tonight for the anointing to negotiate. So David says, he doesn't grab his sword and run and kills Goliath. He says, what else will such a man get? What else? And he says, well, I will settle the debt, not just of him, but his entire family. When God blesses you, he sets a generation free of debt. One deal, one contract, one transaction can set the entire family free. He's not just standing in the gap for him, but for a generation. I will settle the debts of him and his family. Anointing to negotiate. (laughs) What else will such a man get? (laughs) Now it becomes real. Well, he can have my daughter. David has no lineage to kingship. There is no way for his blood lineage to become king. king. But now everything changes for him. He can have my daughter. And now the throne is secured. Everything changes for him in this one contract, one deal, one moment. Now give a man a woman, he'll do anything. So (laughs) David faces Goliath. And it's not just about Goliath. That day, he becomes debt-free. His family becomes debt-free. And he gets set up to be royalty one day. The anointing to negotiate. We have to learn that what we carry, we can release. There's people in here that have faced many giants in their lives and you're carrying the anointing of that giant, it is your responsibility to release that anointing on other people. That's the kingdom. It's not about keeping secrets and everything to yourself and say, well, I had to face it as my victory. No, the kingdom of God has to advance. We have to train the next generation and say to them, this is a, if you don't have debt, this, this race, this war, it's gonna be a lot easier for you. Because you're not going to live your entire life trying to pay off stuff. You're going to be able to focus on the kingdom of God. It will change everything. You're not born, born to pay off debt. You're born to, have, to, be, to be victorious. Different mentality. Now many of us in this room did not have that. But it doesn't mean that we have to force the next generation to start over again. My Two sons will start their lives at the age of 18. Each of them them will get a house as their birthday present when they turn 18. They will not go through the same stuff that I had to go through. What they do with that, I will teach them wisdom, stewardship, but then it's their responsibility from there. They're not going to spend 20 years to pay off a mortgage. It is my responsibility to set them up to be focused more on the kingdom of God than on worldly stuff. That's what I'm trusting God for. That's what I'm fighting for. That's what I'm preparing and planning, investing now for, that they would start early. Let me tell you a secret. When we talk about inheritance, the word inheritance in America and the word inheritance in Israel has two completely different meanings. The reason is, in Israel, in Israel right now, when young people turn 16 in adulthood, between 16 and 18, they receive the inheritance in the beginning of their lives. Not the end. In America and the rest of the world, we receive our inheritance at the end of a person's life. And you know what happens? 
most people take that inheritance, receive it, and then get, give it to the bank. They pay off debt. Completely different principle. And that's why right now, 4% of the world's population is Jews, and they are right now sitting with 40% of the wealth. Because they're not training the young people to fight the debt, they're training them to invest and grow. Completely different. Completely different mindset. And that's when we, when we hear that Christ died and he is our inheritance, we don't understand it. Because we think we have to wait for that at the end of our lives. But yet that inheritance and that fullness and overflow is now. Not one day. It's available right now. Completely different mindset. Is God speaking to you tonight? Are you being challenged? I am. The anointing to negotiate comes on David. You don't have to fight 10 giants, you just have to fight one. Just one. But the truth is tonight that the giants that you don't overcome in your life, your children will inherit. I believe that there's a very specific giant for each of one us that we have to conquer in our life. We have to conquer that giant. We can't retire or run away. We have to face that very thing so it would impact the next generation completely. I want to ask the band, just come to the front and we're going to start to pray. Thank you, Father. God is setting us free. God is setting us free. He is setting us free. God, renewing your mind tonight, setting you free from a poverty mindset. Setting you free. There's great men inside here, great vision, great purpose, great kings. But if you are indebted, if you have a mind of poverty, you'll be limited to do the things that God, the exploits that God has called you to do. If we don't deal with a poverty mindset, it's going to limit you from becoming who God has called you to become. I can prophesy over you the plan, the purposes of God, but if you don't deal with that mindset, you won't understand the plan. You won't understand the purpose. There's many people that I prophesy today, and I can see that they're so enslaved, they don't understand it. They hear, but they don't perceive. They don't get the revelation of what God wants to do. Because as we prophesy, the only thing that they hear is lack, lack, lack. I can do it. Their mind is in a different place. They can't imagine that they, that they would be able to get out of that situation. There's a shift that's taking place. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. I can teach you a whole session on principles and how to help you with the giving and budget and all, all of that stuff. But there must be a kingdom assignment to say, God, this is my number, this is my need, and everything above and beyond this belongs to you. I won't touch it. I won't touch it. This is what I need to live. But everything that comes in, I won't touch it until I consult you. It belongs to you. I'm just a steward of that. I'm not saying to you tonight where you need to give, where you need to support. I'm talking about becoming a channel, a well, that God can flow through. We do not have a money problem. We have a steward problem. God's looking for people that he can trust. That has the kingdom in mind. When you pray again, don't just pray for your family. Pray for someone else's family as well. Pray for them. Think about them. What they're facing, what they're going through. When you buy a new car again, trust God to bless you in such a way where you can buy two. And bless someone else with the exact same vehicle. Not your old hand off. The same vehicle. Bless someone else that, is, that cannot afford that. Something changes when you do that. Something changes. It's, a, it's what you sow. The word tells us it's a principle. Whatever we sow, we will reap. You want the best in your life, then give the best. Let your prayers change. Say, God, bless me so much that I overflow. John 10 verse 10, life and life in abundance. That word abundance is a cup that overflows. It means that every need in my life is met 
There's no desire, no need, and I have more left. The word abundance doesn't mean that I'm taking from one place, out of one place, to give in another place. The word abundance means that there's just no need in my life. It's more than enough. I'm overflowing. The church of God has not stepped into overflow. They've not stepped into abundance, overflow. My cup overflows. I'm full. I am full. As suddenly whatever comes into my life overspills on other people. Because the kingdom is a concern to me. The kingdom, not a brand, a church, the kingdom of God is a concern to me. I want other people to be just as effective in ministry and in business as I am. You did not have someone to help you start that business, but that does not mean that you cannot help someone else now to start theirs. You did not have someone to help you build your ministry, but it doesn't mean that you can enable a young and up and coming evangelist, pastor to be effective and make their life easier. No, 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 they got to start over. Why do every generation have to start over again? We have to push the next generation above and beyond. They need to go more. They have to go above. They have to achieve more has to be debt free. Well, our church debt is paid off. Great. Pay off the next church's debt. Let me tell you today, I don't know what the situation is here in this room right now. I don't know what the situation is. But if this church is still in debt, it has to be settled. I don't know what the situation is. But it has to be settled. To, be, to have more authority in an area and a region, property has to be settled. The church cannot be a place that's indebted. Now, I don't know what's the situation. But let me tell you tonight, being led by the Spirit, not my intuition, not by any other motive, led by the Spirit, if there's debt in this house, it has to be settled. Very quiet. Amen? Amen. Lord, help me to be a channel, to be a blessing. A place that's restoring people's lives, a place that's touching people, that are sitting, that's breaking the curses of their life, cannot be under a curse. Death is a curse. Goliath, the one that enslaves and entraps. It can't function freely. It can't do whatever God tells it to do because it's indebted. It's stuck in a situation. I want to ask you tonight, no pressure. I'm asking you tonight, simple question. No matter whether you're healthy or wealthy or not, if you're rich or poor, if nothing, I'm not speaking about that tonight. I'm asking you tonight if you say, God, use me. Use my, use me. My business, my ministry, my life as a vessel. Use me. I'm serious about this. Use me. This is a covenant that you're entering with God. Not with me, not with the church. This is a kingdom covenant. If you're serious about what I'm sharing with you tonight, and it's between you and God, don't think about maybe later this week you can make that covenant, it's fine. But if you're here tonight, you're saying, God, use me, use my life. Young people that's here in this room. Lord, use me. Position me. Use me as a channel. Use my life. Use my family. Use my hands. Use what I have, Father. Use me. And then something changes and God sets you up with a good life. One transaction. One contract. One deal. You don't need ten contracts. You know, just one. Just one. God, give me one opportunity. Just one opportunity. If you say, Lord, use me, use my life. Again, please think about it. It's a covenant between you and God. I'm going to pray for a couple of things tonight. 
But if that is you, I'm going to ask you to stand up and I'm going to pray with you. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. Lord, use my life. Use my life. Use my life. Pastor, Pastor Mark and the leadership had no clue. I didn't even have a clue what I was going to speak about tonight. I wanted to minister completely something else. And an hour ago, God spoke to me. He said, this is, he said, tonight I'm setting my people free. I came here tonight with a word. It will not return void. It will go. It will accomplish exactly that. God, use me. Work in my life. Work in my life. Thank you, Father, for every person that's standing here right now. Every man. And Father, I'm standing with every person here tonight. And Father, we say, use me. Use my life. Use my life. Father, I, would, I want to be a giver. I want to be a kingdom financier. Whatever you need to do, whether I, whether I understand it, whether I agree with it, Use my life as a vessel to be a powerful tool within your kingdom. Whether I need to give, whether I have to train, whether I have to prepare the next generation, whatever my part is to play, use my life. Use my life. Use my life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. There was a moment with David in the field and he was serious. We don't know what happened, but he drew the presence of God to his life. He was serious about the things of God. He was disqualified by men in every position. To take care of the sheep was not a top position. The sons went to war, but David had to take care of the sheep. His father, his own father did not believe in him. But something happened with him and God in the field. And he became a vessel. He became a tool in the kingdom of God. There was no way to royalty in his life. But a covenant was made between him and God. Thank you, Father, for covenants that are being made tonight. Covenants, Lord. Covenants, Father. Thank you, Lord, when you look at us right now, you're not, you don't see any limitation. Our age, our race, our culture, it's no limitation to you. Our backgrounds, the addictions that we had, stuff we face, even stuff that we are facing right now, it's not a hindrance to you. Amen. We are just a vessel. Thank you, Father, tonight for contracts that's being signed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. I want to invite you to a second invitation. We're going to pray for people right now that has been struggling with a poverty mentality. Poverty mentality. And it's, it's called a, a spirit of poverty. I want to pray with you. Any one of those things that I've read that has affected your life, I want to pray with you tonight that God would release you from a spirit of poverty. If any one of those things is affecting you and you want me to pray with you, I cannot release you from a spirit if I don't have your permission. I can only set you free from what you want to be set free from. It has to be your decision. If any of those things that I've read, it's affecting you and you want me to pray for you, that you would be set free from a poverty mentality. I want you to quickly stand. I want to pray with you. A poverty mentality. Again, you can have, you can be a billionaire and still have a poverty mentality. Now, tonight God is going to take you on a journey to set you free from this. I'm going to pray for that now. Thank you, Father, for every person standing right now. Father, I command the spirit of poverty to leave them right now. Father, generations that have suffered from this, being born into poverty, being trained to live in poverty, 
Only thing they understood is poverty. I command that spirit to leave their lives right now in Jesus' name. It would have no hold upon them any longer. I declare that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. A generation is being set free and being released right now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I want you to sit. Come on. I want, you, uh, I want you to say to the person next to you, I'm free. Tell them I'm free. I'm free. Now that spirit is going to challenge you as soon as you leave this room. I want to prepare you. You're free of it. But when you walk out here, it's waiting for you. It's going to test you. It's going to immediately. It's, going to, it's still there. It's going to see, well, let's see what you're going to do. It's important, but you're going to be reminded. The Holy Spirit will remind you in that moment. So you're not going to bargain. If you see that sail bargain, you drive in the opposite direction. <laughs> we have to have wisdom. If you're overpaying for stuff, that's your <laughs> ignorance. But... We don't chase bargains. We don't run off the bargains. This whole world is a bargain mentality. It's driven. Every month a different sale, 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 sale. And people keep on thinking they bargain. They're winning, they're winning, they're winning. Proverbs says, um, the buyer says, yes, yes, it's a good deal. And then he walks out and he realizes, no, no, I've been trapped myself. Amen. Last thing that I want to pray for, the idea tonight is not to expose you in any way. But I want to pray with you tonight that God would make you debt-free. Number one, is you have to believe that God wants you to be debt-free. If you still think that God wants you to be in debt, you have to renew your mind. God wants you to be debt-free. Again, wisdom. I don't know if there's something as good debt, but you have to have wisdom. You have to have wisdom. Debt is when you Borrow something from the future for the now. You're lending from the future. You're selling a part of your future. And so I believe that God wants you to be debt free. In fact, I believe that God wants every Christian son and daughter to be debt free. You know, Adam and Eve had no debt. God called them to reign. Adam wasn't struggling to sleep at night because of all the bills that he had to pay. He had to reign. God gave him instruction to reign. Name the animals. Adam didn't know what debt is. Our spirit wasn't, our spirit doesn't understand debt. Our spirit does not want to be enslaved and trapped. And there's many principles and things that I can share with you in how to know whether you are in debt. Signs of of being in debt, many things. One of the things is, if you cannot get up tomorrow morning and go on a vacation for a month, you're in debt. If you're still being controlled by circumstances, where you have to show up tomorrow morning at a certain hour, at a certain place, it's debt. It means you are entrapped in a situation. A lot of details in that. And so when God speaks to you and says, well, I need you to do this, you can't do it, you have to postpone the plan of God because you, you, you are indebted, you're enslaved. So number one, God wants you to be free. So you have to believe that. And then I'm going to pray with you now that God is going to set you free. I am trusting God that within the next 12 months that He would settle your debt. 12 months, I believe that He can do it. I've seen it in my life. But from this day forth, you cannot make more debt. You have to make a quality decision to be wise. And I'm going to pray also for wisdom for you tonight, that with debt cancellation, we're going to pray for wisdom to be able to help you to be wise in making decisions, to have wisdom when it comes to finance. Remember, it's not a money problem, it's a wisdom problem. You can have a person today, settle their debt, and then next month they, it's worse. Debt has to become your enemy. 
You can't play with it. It has to become your enemy. It has to be, it has to, you have to see it as your enemy. I'm talking about bad debt. Bad debt. People are so indebted. You know the American culture, I don't know how you sleep with all the credit cards. All the... Complicated. You know, I'm not even a citizen. I'm getting offers in the mail. I don't know where they heard or what. I just have a, just have a PO, like a postal address and I'm getting all these invitations. Anyway, yeah. God can set you debt-free. It's not a, we don't have to make it spiritual or holy. God can make you debt-free. I'm trusting that within the next 12 months, God sets you on a journey to help you to deal with stuff. I also pray that the Holy Spirit will show you what you need to deal with. We are at different places. In my life, He showed me I need to deal with that vehicle. He showed me what the problem was. And I had to address it. I had to change it. And this is what I'm praying is that God would show you today what to deal with. And we see it in 1 Kings when the prophet comes, the widow comes, she says, my husband has died and they are here to take my sons. I can't pay my debt. And so they're here. They're coming to collect my sons. And then Elijah says, well, what do you have? She says, I have the oil. And he says, no, no, go out and get all the jars that you can. That whole <laughs> miracle was because of a woman that was in debt. That's where the whole thing started. The multiplication started because she was in a situation and it was busy destroying. The king was on her way. And this is what we need to understand that if debt doesn't destroy us, it destroys our children. And so here they're coming for her sons to collect her sons to be slaves. If you're here tonight and you are in debt, I don't want to expose you. It's nothing to do with that. I'm talking about bad debt, debt that you need to get rid of, debt that's a problem. If you're here tonight, you want me to pray with you, you want to be set free, I want you to stand. I'm going to pray for you to be debt free in Jesus' name. God's going to set you free. I'm, I'm, I'm here in the spirit 12 months. That's what I hear. And so I'm, going to, I'm holding on to that. It's the number that I, that Lord showed me. 12 months. 12 months. Within the next 12 months, God's setting you free. Free. You're not going to go back into that. I pray for testimonies. that will come back and you will testify about what God has done. God will get the glory for what we do tonight. Not Andre. God will get it. He's the only person that can set you free. God will get the glory. He will get the glory. Amen. Father, thank you for every person standing right now. Father, I pray that you would make them debt free. Debt free. You would settle their debts. I pray for wisdom right now to come upon them that even as you set them free, that they would have wisdom to navigate from here on. They would have wisdom. Lord, I pray for testimonies that would arise of how you have supernaturally. It was impossible against all odds, but then supernaturally you came and you did the impossible for them and within their lives. As the Father, right now tonight, I set them free of any form of debt. They will not be bounded. Anything that's holding them back, Goliath, the one that entraps, the one that enslaves, I release them in Jesus' name. I release them. I set them free. They will have vision again. They will have purpose again, joy again. I pray for marriages that have been affected in this room by debt. Healing would come. Restoration would come in relationships because of that. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I want to ask everyone in the room just to stand with me and let's give God the glory. Thank you.